All right, now that I got you guys all warmed up, who's really excited about demon-possessed nuns? Yeah. It's so much easier. I should just start doing that all the time. Okay, uh, please welcome Beth for her story of the demon-possessed nuns of Laodon. Short person. Short. Very short. Okay. So... I have got a story for you that is super weird, and it's one of the weirdest stories out of the 17th century, which is saying something, because the 17th century was really fucking weird. Um, on August 18th of 1634, in the French town of Loudun, a priest by the name of Urbain Grandier was burned at the stake. And his crime was sorcery and signing a blood pact with demons. <laughs> As you do. Um, now, I have to preface this by saying that when I began this, the research for this talk, I was completely overwhelmed by the complexity of it. There were just so many angles from which I could approach the story. And I guess I could have you know, approached it from the political and religious unrest angle, including the siege of La Rochelle, which occurred just seven years prior, when in a grab for more power, Cardinal Richelieu teamed up with the royal forces of King Louis XIII, and together they were victorious in war against the French Protestant Huguenots. But I could also talk about a particularly virulent outbreak of plague that swept through the area, claiming the lives of close to 4,000 people right within that immediate vicinity. Loudon was ground zero for all of these things. Pestilence. But Pestilence! But rather than use the political, religious, or social influences of the time as a lens through which we can interpret the events that happened in Loudon, or um, focus on the man himself, uh, Urban Grandier, I want to turn our attention to the nuns at the Ursuline convent where this all took place, particularly the obsession of one woman, mother superior and principal demoniac in the mass possession, Jean des Anges. She was born Jean de Belciel in 1602 to a noble family. However, a childhood bout of tuberculosis stunted her growth and left her with a hunchback as well as a pretty nasty disposition. Um, she was very distrustful of people. She was generally unpleasant to be around. Her, her family didn't know what to do with her, so they shipped her off to a convent at a very early age. And Joan of the Angels, as she came to be called, did not readily take to monastic life. She was lazy. She didn't particularly care for the ritual and all the blah, blah, blah. But she was sly and conniving and managed very quickly to work her way up the ranks at the convent, finding herself in the position of Mother Superior fairly quickly all through manipulation, not through actual devotion. And th the story of what happened in Loudon has fascinated scholars and clergy and lay people for centuries, and it has inspired incredible works of art like this particular painting, um, books such as a very well-researched and incredibly dense book by Aldous Huxley, an opera, and several films, including one by Ken Russell of Lair of the White Worm fame. And his film, The Devils, starred Vanessa Redgrave as Jean and Oliver Reed as Urbain Grandier. And the, many of the images that you will see from here on out are stills from that film. In 1617, the very handsome and openly non-celibate Father Grandier arrived in Loudon to serve as the parish priest. 
And he did little to conceal his promiscuity. He banged everything he could get his hands on. He knocked up the daughter of the local public prosecutor. And he took as his mistress the young orphaned daughter of a royal counselor. And by some accounts, in a private and secret ceremony, they were married. He was a hit with the ladies, but the men hated him, especially men in positions of power. And he, they did everything to try to, you know, topple him, but he was a hit. He made the ladies blush, and including many of the nuns and young novices at the convent, many of whom had been cloistered not because of a love of God, but because of a lack of dowry, or because for other reasons they were unmarriageable, they were considered unattractive, they were in some way deformed. But the point being, these were healthy young women with healthy young libidos, and they were stuck in a convent, but the villagers who would visit the convent, or in some cases were employed by the convent, would thrill these girls with tales of the young, virile, handsome priest. And they became enthralled by him, particularly because <laughs> he was just a rock star. He was a total heartthrob. And if we could just take a moment, uh, you know, when I found this magazine cover, it just sort of broke my heart. Look at the amount of tragedy on this <laughs> magazine cover. It's just, feel free to say a little prayer. Anyway, um, despite never having actually met him in person, Jean in particular became completely obsessed with Grandier. And she did not hide her feelings from the other nuns. She regaled them with tales of her, her dreams and her fantasies. And she also wrote in a journal. And um, in it she wrote, and I quote, when I did not see him, I burned with love for him. And when he presented himself to me, I lacked the faith to combat the impure thoughts and movements that I felt. Never had the demons created such disorder in me. <laughs> Bow chicka wow wow. So when the confessor of the convent died, Jean immediately requested that Grandier fill the position because she wanted him nearby. <laughs> However, he declined, stating that he felt he was unworthy and he thought that he was of better service to the community if he stayed at the parish church. In his stead, a Father Mignon was sent to take the nun's confessions. Enraged by this apparent snub, Jean immediately decided to seek revenge. And she started by confessing to Mignon that Grandier had been visiting her nightly. His spectral body was seducing her and enticing her to participate in <laughs> unspeakable acts of which she was absolutely helpless to defend herself. She confessed to lurid dreams in which Grandier appeared to her as the image of Christ after freeing himself from the cross and she tended to his wounds. <laughs> she was having demonic fits and writhing and speaking in tongues and speaking of things that nuns absolutely should not be speaking of. And it rippled through the entire convent and soon most of the nuns and novices were ex exhibiting dis symptoms of a full-blown demonic possession epidemic. And it became a source of local entertainment. People would flock to the convent to see the crazy nuns. And all fingers pointed to Grandier. 
He'd made so many enemies, including Mignon, that what happened next was pretty much inevitable. The nuns were gathered up and threatened with execution for their wickedness at having fallen prey to demonic possession. And when they said, oh no, we were just kidding, we were just playing, you know, he's really cute. Um, they cried and begged for their lives and a deal was offered. They were told that if they kept up the act until Grandier was destroyed, they would then be absolved. And so they agreed. They continued to demonstrate these symptoms and uh, another priest was brought in from uh, the Carmelite church, uh, a man by the name of Father Barre, who according to Ken Russell looked a lot like a cross between Tom Petty and David Bowie. <laughs> and feel free to say another prayer. Um, Initially, Grandier said this was all ludicrous. Who could possibly believe it? He'd never been to the convent. He'd never met any of these people. He even confronted Jean during her exorcisms. And one thing of note, these people, these, you know, we think we're kinky. These were some kinky people. During her exorcism in an attempt to rid her of a demon that had lodged itself in her abdomen, she was given a quart of holy water by enema. <laughs> anyway, it was determined that she was possessed, science, it, she was determined, she was, <laughs> it was determined that she was possessed by not one, not two, but by seven, <laughs> seven demons, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. And those demons revealed themselves to be Asmodeus, Behemoth, Bolam, Azakaram, and Veliathan. You, nobody can ever remember all seven. Also, a parchment was very conveniently produced, which they claimed had been the actual blood pact that Grandier and the demons had signed. Grandier faced a very short and quick trial with a small tribunal, was found guilty, and like many accused of witchcraft before him, he was tortured. Uh, he had his tongue and his testicles impaled with spikes. He had both of his legs smashed to smithereens with a hammer, and yet he refused to confess. He confessed to all of his sins of the flesh, but he said he would rather meet his God honestly than confess to sins that he had not committed in just an attempt to avoid suffering. In the town square, he was tied to the stake. The executioner promised to strangle him before the flames were lit, but he was unable to do so and Grandier was burned alive. Following the execution, Jean, having gotten a taste of fame and attention, continued to demonstrate symptoms of possession, and she went on the circuit. She uh, gained audience with nobility and royalty, and she was hailed by some as a living saint, while others, including Cardinal Richelieu, believed that she was a fraud. In 1644, she began writing her memoirs, and she never once showed any remorse for her part in the death of Grandier. However, she did admit to depression that led her to two suicide attempts. She died in January of 1665, and her head was removed from her body and placed in a silver and gold reliquary along with another piece that had already been made into a relic, a, um, a gown of hers that she claimed had been stained with holy oil from a vision of being anointed by one of the saints. Um, also, the convent had commissioned a huge painting to uh, be made that showed her, one of her many exorcisms. And unfortunately, all three pieces have either been very well hidden or completely lost to history. Nobody knows where they are now. 
In closing, I would like to turn to an unexpected source, uh, English author William Congreve. I wonder when he wrote his play, The Morning Bride, if this story had influenced him when one line reads, no one is angrier than a woman than who has been rejected in love. And you probably know that by its much more popular adaptation, Hell Hath No Fury Like a Woman Scorned. Thank you.